You on the line with us is Professor Steve King. He's the head of the School of Economics, Politics, and History at Kingston University in London, the United Kingdom. His website's debtdeflation.com slash blogs and ideaeconomics.org. You can tweet him at Prof Steve, S-T-E-V-E, Keen, K-E-E-N. And uh, Steve, welcome. It's been, geez, it seems like it's been about a year since we talked. It's been way too long. Welcome back to the program. It's nice to be here, Tom. Actually, these days I'm mainly on Patreon, too, by the way. I've moved over to a Patreon site, a Patreon dot, uh, slash Prof Steve Keen. That's where people can find most of my work. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for that. And so, you know, we're, we, we have what appears to be an economic recovery. The Dow is hitting all-time highs right now. And uh, the president's bragging about how wonderful the economy is, and unemployment seems to be low. Although I understand that there have been changes in the way that the, the unemployment numbers that are used for that context have been figured. Like we no longer count people who are, uh, you know, quote, discouraged workers. They really want a job, but they're just, they live someplace where there are no jobs and they've given up. Um, what is the actual state of our economy and how can we have an economic recovery when the economy is not actually getting better for the average person? Well, if you look at the level of employment in America, uh, there's actually separate statistics recorded for the employment rate and the unemployment rate. And if the two were both uh, validly calculated, then, of course, one would be the mirror image of the other. That is the case relatively in the UK. But when you look at the United States, absolutely not. The employment numbers actually peaked in 2000. Uh, they then fell substantially with the recession, uh, with the dot-com bus bubble bursting back then, rose once more to peak uh, at a lower level in 2007, and then plunged during the, the Great Recession, and they have still not recovered uh, to the level that they were prior to the 2007 bubble, so bubble bursting. So on the employment data, in fact, employment is substantially worse than it was in 2000. And even if you take into account demographic change, there are about 3 million Americans who had jobs in 2000 who, who don't have jobs today. And maybe now, I think it's down about two and a half, to, to, between two and two and a half million people now. But it's still a substantial fraction of the workforce that do not have jobs. Whereas at the same time, the unemployment rate is now down below what it was before the bubble burst back in 2007. So I don't think the economy is doing anywhere near as well as the unemployment data implies. And of course, we know the growth rate has been relatively anemic for the last decade. So we're being so scammed with these numbers? Stock market than it has been in the real economy, though the real economy has recovered. And part of the recovery is because the whole crisis, as you know, I believe, argue, was caused by a collapse in, in credit. Uh, and that led to a fall in private debt from the historically high level of 170% of GDP down to 100 and about 145 percent it's now starting to rise once more and as it's rising that's fueling some additional demand so the increase in demand is coming partly out of that credit credit basis but mainly i think it's been inflated by qe which of course has inflated asset prices by far more which which was my second question for you is to what extent is uh what is being called the recovery anyway it's certainly a recovery for the top 10 20 percent of americans who own stock um, uh, to what extent has that recovery in the stock market been caused by the central banks buying up toxic assets and buying up bonds, um, you know, injecting money and injecting credit into the economy? And am I even saying that right, Steve? Yeah, well, you think you're quite right because uh, when you look at what the central banks did, of course, they had absolutely no idea the crisis was coming. When it hit them, they went into panic mode. And in panic mode, they firstly they pumped an enormous amount of money into bank reserves, uh, a gigantic increase under, under Bernanke's uh, uh, control of the Fed. It was like $20 then trillion, they wasn't QE, it? And in many ways, what they were doing was they did something unconventional using conventional channels, and that is the central banks always deal with, other, with, with private banks, and all they could think of doing is rescuing the private banks. And what they did was they'd say, we're going to be on the buy side of bond transactions, which they have all the time with private banks, to the tune, in America's case, of $1 trillion uh, U.S. a year. Now, that, you know, is, is, is more than 5% of the economy. It's a substantial amount of money. But what it was doing is when they would buy the bonds off the private banks, the private banks would each year have a, a trillion dollars more cash and a trillion dollars less income earning bonds than they had beforehand. That encouraged them to go and buy shares. Of course, they bought shares of people who own shares who don't happen to be your average Walmart worker. 
that drove up the, the price of the shares and the owners of those shares could sell them for a profit and if you, you, if you imagine what they were doing with them, they, of course they'd buy other assets such as housing but also different shares again and maybe 10% of the money they got they might have spent buying a, the odd Lamborghini and getting one of those ex-Walmart employees to clean it for them. Uh, so consequently maybe about 10% of that trillion actually turned up in the real economy. So it was a very inefficient way of powering the real economy, but a very powerful way of propelling up share prices and making the Wall Street economy feel much better. So we have a situation now where uh, some of these very large companies are announcing their share buybacks, and they're, they're literally multi-billion dollar share buybacks. Um, how, how does that, I mean, I, I've explained this before to people that, you know, if you've got a million shares at $100 each and you buy back half a million shares, then each share now is not worth $100, it's worth $200. So buying your shares back and having a company basically retire their shares increases the price of those shares. Uh, but, you know, no actual value has been created. No new things have been sold. The company hasn't actually gotten wealthier. It just drives up the stock market because so many of the senior executives now are being compensated with stock. They're getting richer and richer. Is that an accurate analysis, and is that what's going on right now? It is an accurate analysis, and in, in many ways it's a failure of comprehension by the central banks because they didn't deliberately set out to make the rich even richer, but the mechanisms that they're used to using, which is dealing with other private banks, uh, necessarily meant that those private banks were the ones who received the money that the uh, cred Fed created, um, out, of, out of nothing, double entry bookkeeping, you didn't pay any taxes for the trillion dollars a year they were spending buying bonds off the private banks. But what that meant was it made the wealthy even wealthier, when in fact that was one of the side effects of the rise, the asset price bubble back in, before 2007. So we had a symptom of increasing inequality coming out of the debt levered a private debt levered bubble up to 2007 and the remedy to the central banks who were clueless about what caused the crisis in the first place actually extended or accentuated that inequality even more. Yeah, so I've got, for example, I have a, a press release here from uh, Chuck Schumer's office, the, uh, you know, the head of the Democrats in the U.S. Senate. And uh, after the Senate passed the bill, the tax cut, uh, these companies announced these kinds of share buybacks. Home Depot is going to take $15 billion of their tax cut and buy their back own shares back. Oracle, $12 billion. Honeywell, $6.5 billion. Pfizer, $10 billion. Bank of America, $5 billion. Anthem, $5 billion. Boeing, $4 billion. MasterCard, $4 billion. United Airlines, $3 billion. PPG, $2.5 billion. American Tower, $2 billion. T-Mobile, $1.5 billion. It goes on and on. You get the trend. Um, this was something that, A, would have been um, not even possible back in the 80s? I mean, when they changed the rules on executive compensation, it used to be you couldn't uh, compensate executives with stock like this, and you couldn't play games with stock like this. Um, I'm not sure that companies could or couldn't buy back their shares. I, d I don't know if that rule changed or not. Please let me know. Mm. Um, but is that going to drive these shares up? And by the way, we've only got about 30 seconds. Yeah, it's driven the press shares up and really it's, it's made capitalism even more unequal than it would be without the intervention of the central bank. And that's the opposite of what they should be doing. So they really have damaged uh, their own credibility out of this while causing a anemic recovery for most of the economy and a fantastic one for the Wall Streets. Wow. So the, the central banks are, 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 are driving this, this process and the, and the big corporations are taking advantage of it and all the rest of us get standing outside on the outside looking in. Professor Steve Keen. Uh, the School of Economics, uh, uh, Politics and History at Kingston University.